Hi and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Welcome to episode 75 on Eucharistic Miracles. Yes! I've been so keen to talk about this for so long and now it's finally happening, so this is great. Today we're going to talk about four different Eucharistic miracles. We're going to talk about the very first ever recorded example of a Eucharistic miracle, and then we're going to talk about three different events that occurred in recent decades around the world. And the reason why I've chosen more recent examples of miracles is because today we have access to a whole bunch of scientific equipment and knowledge that means that we're able to study these Eucharistic miracles with even greater sort of scientific rigor. and We can find out so much more about them, which makes them all the more powerful and compelling. However, there are many, many examples of Eucharistic miracles from all over the world, from as far back as the 8th century. So today is going to be like a little bit of a taster, but if you want to learn more, you can go. I mean, there are many awesome books about Eucharistic miracles. I'll include some links in the show notes. And also, of course, the website that Carlo Acuda made, eucharisticmiracles.org or something. Anyway, I'll include a link to it in the show notes and you can look that up as well. So a few points before we get started, just some things to bear in mind as we talk through these miracles. There's actually um, a transcript of an address that was given by Bishop Raffaello Martinelli, who is an official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and he gave this address at the opening of the exhibition of Eucharistic miracles that Carlo Acutis put together. And he talks about both the power of Eucharistic miracles, but also the limitations that they present. And it's important to be aware of these things and to keep them in mind. The first thing that he says is that our faith in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist is not founded on Eucharistic miracles. So we don't believe that our Lord is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, because, you know, this miracle happened in Lanciano in the 8th century. No, we believe that our Lord is truly present because he told us that he is. (laughs) We believe that Jesus is God, that he is who he says he is, and so we can trust what he says. In the words of St. Thomas Aquinas, truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. If Jesus tells us, this is my body and this is my blood, then we believe him. The role of Eucharistic miracles isn't to prove the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but to bolster our faith, to encourage us to have greater devotion and to strengthen our belief that he is truly there. So on a related note, Bishop Martinelli also reminds us that we are not obliged as Christians to believe in Eucharistic miracles, not even when they've been approved by the church. I mean, in principle, of course, because we're Christians and we have faith, we believe in the possibility of Eucharistic miracles. We believe in them per se, but we aren't obliged to believe in individual instances of miracles. It's totally up to us. So when the church approves a Eucharistic miracle, first of all, The church doesn't come out and say, oh, we are scientific experts and we've decided that this was miraculous. The church is not a body of scientists. Okay, so what the church will do is she will commission an investigation when something happens that seems like it might be of supernatural origin. And then scientists will go away and conduct their own rigorous tests and they'll come back to the church and say, yes, this is inexplicable or no, this can be explained naturally. The church's role is then just to say, okay, well, there is nothing in this miracle that goes against our faith or against the teachings of the church. And that means that Catholics, if they would like to, may give their assent to it as a miracle. They might say, yes, I believe that this is miraculous if they want to, but you you don't have to. No one has to. So Eucharistic miracles are not the source of our faith in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and we don't have to believe in them. However, that doesn't mean that they're not very powerful and very good things. Okay, God permits them for a reason. These miracles remind us of the presence of the supernatural. There's this great quote from Bishop Martinelli's address where he says, The Eucharistic miracle has no scientific explanation. It goes beyond human reason and challenges a person to go beyond the perceptible, the visible and the human, and to admit that there is something incomprehensible and unexplainable with human reason alone, something that cannot be scientifically demonstrated. So in a sense, these miracles kind of 
invite us to look up, as it were. Like they kind of lift us out of, of the everyday and remind us, hey, there is a supernatural world around you. Secondly, Eucharistic miracles can, as we've said, increase our faith and our devotion and our love for our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And this is a really important point to remember. These miracles remind us that every single Mass is miraculous. There's this other quote from Bishop Martinelli's address that says, We must never forget nor fail to mention that the Eucharist is the true, great, inexhaustible, daily miracle. So every single Eucharist is a miracle. Every single time I go to Mass, bread and wine is transubstantiated and truly becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Like that is an incredible, mind-blowing miracle. So in the examples that we're going to discuss today, these miraculous realities are made tangible and visible to us, but they actually occur every single time that we go to Mass. And this is why learning about these miracles can be really helpful because it reminds us of that fact. Okay, so without further ado, let's look at our four miracles. So we're going to start with the oldest one and then progress to the most recent one. The very first recorded Eucharistic miracle, which is also probably one of the most famous, occurred around the year 750 AD in Lanciano in Italy. So the story goes that a priest was celebrating Mass, and this priest had been having constant doubts about whether or not our Lord was truly present in the Eucharist. So he was saying Mass, and as he was saying the words of consecration, the host was suddenly visibly transformed into a circle of human flesh, and the wine was transformed into blood, which quickly began to coagulate or become solid in the chalice. Apparently, the priest was so overwhelmed and overpowered by this that he burst into tears, and members of the congregation started to come up to the altar to see what had happened, and they witnessed that the bread and wine had visibly transformed into flesh and blood. The host and the blood were placed in a reliquary, or a container for keeping relics, And they've been preserved up until the present day. And today they can be seen at the Church of St. Francis in Lanciano. So the host and the blood have been scientifically tested many times over the centuries. However, the most rigorous testing occurred in the year 1970. So that's what we're going to focus on today. In 1970... Tests were carried out by the head physician of the hospital in Arezzo. His name was Dr. Edward Linoli, and he was a professor of anatomy, histology, chemistry, and clinical microscopy. Linoli carried out thorough scientific testing of the relics and published a report that contained the following findings. First, he found that the host was definitely made of human flesh. In fact, it was part of the muscular tissue of the heart called the myocardium. It contained no trace of any kind of preservative agent, but despite this, it had survived for about 1,300 years. The slice of tissue was such a finely dissected cross-section of the human heart that Linoli believed that it would have required incredibly precise anatomical dissection done by specialised instruments that did not exist at the time. The second finding was that the coagulated blood was truly human blood. It belonged to the blood type AB, which is incidentally the same blood type as that found on the Shroud of Turin. Linoli noted that if this blood had been taken from the human body as part of a hoax, it would have immediately begun to decay, especially since there were no signs of any preservative agents used to keep it fresh. Secondly, both the blood and the host had been kept in receptacles for 1300 years that were not hermetically sealed. So that meant that they would have been exposed to the effects of the air for over a thousand years. So what you would expect is that the flesh and blood would have completely disintegrated by this point. Despite this, although the appearance of both have changed over time, so if you look at them today, they look kind of like dusty and and dried and old, both remain intact and undamaged, even though they haven't been preserved at all. Finally, Linoli found that the percentage ratio of the proteins in the blood was the same as that found in fresh human blood. Now, this is not only strange, it is completely inexplicable for blood that has been sitting there for 1,300 years. Okay, so it was a pretty powerful set of findings. 
Now, one final point to make about this miracle before we move on. Sometimes when people talk about the miracle of Lanciano, they claim that there was actually another investigation, another scientific investigation that took place after Dr. Linoli's, and it was conducted by the World Health Organization. So the story is that the World Health Organization wanted to you know, prove or disprove these findings, so they conducted their own tests, and their tests agreed with everything that Dr. Linoli had found. Now, this is in fact not true. There is no evidence whatsoever that the World Health Organization did or would ever conduct tests like these. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it sounds like a bit of a killjoy thing to say. Well, because this anecdote comes up quite a lot. And it's really important when we talk about Eucharistic miracles that we're spreading information that is correct, not just for the sake of truth and justice, but also for the sake of credibility. Because if we're spreading something that isn't true alongside stuff that is, then the untrue stuff can undermine the true stuff. And that would be a shame because everything else that I've told you about this miracle and the tests that were conducted on it is true and amazing and powerful. So if anyone ever tells you that the World Health Organization tested the host and the blood for the miracle of Lanciano, then you can just gently and with a lot of charity, (laughs) correct them and point them towards the scientific testing that actually did occur. Okay, so that's the miracle of Lanciano. We are now going to skip ahead all the way to the year 1996. So this next miracle occurred in the Archdiocese of Buenos Aires. During Mass, the priest was giving communion and a woman came up to him and pointed out that a host had been discarded towards the back of the church. It had actually been left in a candle holder sitting next to a crucifix. Now, this candle holder was super dusty. So the priest, instead of just consuming the host, which is what he normally would have done, he did what the church prescribes, which is... He put the host in a bowl of water and left it in the tabernacle so that it could dissolve into the water and then be disposed of later. Now, a week later, when the host was retrieved from the tabernacle, the priest found that it hadn't fully dissolved and the remaining portion of the host had turned a bright red colour. In fact, the water in the bowl had turned red as well, as though there were diluted blood in it. Eventually, the red fragment of the host was transferred into a test tube filled with distilled water. It remained there in that test tube for three years. During those three years, it did not visibly change at all. And finally, in the year 1999, permission was granted to test the host. And it was granted by, guess who? The Archbishop of Buenos Aires, who is today Pope Francis. The fragment of host was eventually tested by eight scientists from around the world. One of them was a forensic pathologist from Columbia University named Dr. Frederick Zugaby. Side note, one of the most fun names to say ever. I dare you to say it out loud. Dr. (laughs) Zugaby. Interestingly, Dr. Zugaby was given no information about what the sample was. None of the scientists were. They were just given this fragment and asked to analyse it and tell them what they could see. So he didn't know what it was. He just knew he'd been given this sample. So there's, it's amazing. There's actually footage because they made a documentary about this. These two Australians represent, went and filmed um, this process of testing this particle of the host. So there's footage of this pathologist explaining what he's looking at. He's looking into the microscope and he looks at the sample and the first thing he says he's like oh yeah this is heart tissue and then he goes on to talk about what he can see and he says this heart tissue has degenerated due to some kind of medical trauma so he says it could have been that the person had had a heart attack or maybe a car accident where they had trauma to the chest or he says they might have been severely beaten over the chest so whatever had happened specifically this person had experienced a severe trauma to the heart Now, the following is an excerpt from an account given by the lead investigator, whose name was Dr. Ricardo Castagnon Gomez. He says, Dr. Zugabi confirmed that my patient had suffered a lot. Then I asked him, Doctor, why has my patient suffered a lot? He answered me, because your patient has some thrombi. At certain moments, he could not breathe. Oxygen did not reach him. He laboured and suffered much because every aspiration was painful. Probably they gave him a blow at the level of the chest. Moreover, the heart showed dynamic activity 
at the moment when you brought me the sample. He says, we found some intact white blood cells, and white blood cells are transported only by the blood. Thus, if white blood cells are here, it's because at the moment in which you brought me the sample, it was pulsating. (laughs) How crazy is that? So this doctor said all of this having no idea what the sample was or where it had come from. He just made these observations. He was like, this person has had some kind of trauma, probably a blow to the chest. He was suffering a lot and the heart was beating. It was pulsating at the moment when this tissue was taken. So they then told him where the tissue had come from. And you can see on the footage, he's like, what? That's no, what? (laughs) It's amazing. Another forensic pathologist who examined this sample, his name was Dr. Robert Lawrence from San Francisco. He said that the sample was made of heart tissue and he also noted that it contained white blood cells. Now he pointed out that the presence of the white blood cells was inexplicable. He said, if heart tissue was taken from a body, White blood cells would begin to dissolve within minutes. At the most, they would be gone within an hour or two. So when he was told that the sample had been sitting in water for three years and that the white blood cells were still intact, he was like, that is completely inexplicable. In fact, the very fact that the tissue itself was still intact after three years of sitting in water was completely inexplicable. There's this great footage of Dr. Zugabi being told about the origin of the heart tissue, and he's looking at an image of the tissue in the test tube, and he's like, are you sure that's not formaldehyde? Are you sure that's, that's, that's water? That can't be water. That's very difficult to believe. So apparently both of these doctors were so cynical about the idea that it had been sitting in water for so long that the investigators eventually went and got the liquid from the test tube tested to make sure that it actually was water. And the scientists who tested this liquid found not only was it water, but it contained absolutely no evidence of any kind of preservative agent. Now, one little final fun fact about this miracle. The guy who led the investigation, Dr. Ricardo Castañón Gómez, At the beginning of this investigation, he was an atheist. He didn't even believe in God at the beginning of the investigation. By the end of the investigation, he had converted to Catholicism (laughs) because he was so bowled over by what he found. Okay, so that's the miracle from Buenos Aires in the year 1996. We now skip ahead to the year 2006 to Tisla, Mexico. This miracle occurred again during Mass at the parish of St. Martin of Tours. While communion was being distributed, one of the religious sisters who was distributing communion suddenly turned to the priest and she was looking at him and she had tears in her eyes. And the priest was like, what, what is it? And she showed him that one of the hosts in the pics had begun to emit a red substance that looked like blood. And you can actually find a photo of this online. You can look it up and there'll be links in the show notes. So the priest obviously preserved the host And in the year 2009, three years later, the local bishop commissioned an investigation. And guess who led the investigation? Old mate, the same guy, Dr. Ricardo Castañón Gómez. (laughs) So this guy was invited to lead the investigation because he'd kind of done it before and like knew the ropes. So Dr. Castañón Gómez led a team of scientists who conducted extensive tests over three years on the host. They reported the following findings. First of all, The red substance was human blood of the type AB, as in the other miracles and just like the blood found on the Shroud of Turin. The distribution of the blood, the way that it appeared on the host, made it clear that it had bled out from inside the host. So it hadn't been dripped onto the host or placed on top of it from the outside. It had come from inside the host. The blood on the surface level of the host was coagulated or congealed, but when they tested it in 2010, they found that the blood on the inside of the host was fresh blood. And this is four years after the original incident had happened. The tissue that they found in the host was part of the myocardium of the heart. So it was heart muscle, just like with all of the other Eucharistic miracles. As well as this... The tissue was, just like in the Buenos Aires case, it was found to be living cardiac tissue. The study concluded that this event has no natural explanation. Okay, 
So that's Mexico 2006. The final miracle that we're going to talk about occurred in the year 2008 in Poland, in Sokolka. So again, this miracle occurred during Mass. A priest was distributing Holy Communion and one of the hosts fell on the ground. So the priest picked up the host and, as is required, he placed it in a container of water and put it away in a locked safe so that it could disintegrate over a few days. Now, the only people who had keys to that safe were the parish priest and the sacristan, Sister Julia. A week later, the parish priest asked Sister Julia, can you please go and check and make sure that that host has been dissolved so that we can dispose of it? So Sister Julia went to check. And what she found was that the host was not only still intact after a week in water, but that there was a bright red stain in the centre of the host. She told the parish priest about it. And then he told some other priests and they came to have a look and everyone was like, what the heck, this is really weird. But they didn't do anything yet because they knew, it was very prudent, they knew that this could be one of those instances where it's just a kind of mould or some other natural phenomenon. And so they just decided to leave it for a little while. So another week passed. And after a week, what they found was that the host had kind of partially dissolved and all that remained was this red substance that looked like blood. So the priest contacted the archbishop and the archbishop said, okay, let's remove this portion of the host from the water and we'll place it on a corporal, which is a small altar cloth, and we'll lock it away in the tabernacle. Now this portion of host remained in the tabernacle for three years. Over those three years, the fragment kind of naturally dried out and became kind of fused to the corporal. But in every other way, it remained exactly the same as it had been three years ago. So after three years, the archbishop created an ecclesial commission to study this fragment of host. A piece of it was taken and analysed in two separate independent studies by two professors in histopathology, which is the study of tissues, at the Medical University of Bialystok. The results of the two independent studies were the same. Both concluded that the fragment was part of the myocardial tissue of a human heart. The heart belonged to a person who was close to death. No foreign substance had been added to the heart tissue to preserve it. Now, the craziest thing that they found, this is like, this one blows my mind almost more than anything else. I don't know why, but I just think find this completely wild. What they found was that there was still a bit of bread remaining that had not yet dissolved. And the bread was fused to the human tissue like completely fused in a way that is impossible. Like they bled into one another and they were like, this is not possible by human means. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Okay. So those are our four Eucharistic miracles. So amazing. Do you know what I love across all of these miracles? And it's very obvious. I'm sure you would have noticed it as well, but I love that in every instance, the host transforms into part of our Lord's heart. It's like he wants to remind us that like of all of the things that we can take away from the Eucharist, he reminds us of how much he loves us, that this is an act of love. He gives us his whole self and his whole heart every single day in the Eucharist. It's just such a beautiful reality. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Our next episode, I literally have no idea what we're going to talk about because hopefully, fingers crossed, next time I talk to you, I will have some Admitted. So at the moment, all I can think about is Shakespeare. So our next episode is going to be a surprise, surprise. <laughs> oh, so today we are going to finish by listening to a verse from one of the greatest hymns ever written, which is uh, a hymn called the Adoro Te Devote, which is written by St. Thomas Aquinas in honour of the Eucharist. FYI, a full version of this recording is going to be on Patreon for patrons. Um, and I would encourage everyone actually to take the Adoro Te Devote to your prayer at some point this week, because it is an incredible hymn and it is really helpful for praying, like meditating on the reality of our Lord's presence in the Eucharist. Okay. Well, that's it from me for today. I will talk to you soon. Have a fantastic fortnight. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Thank you.
Hey friends, thanks for listening to this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast and you would like to see it continue and reach many more people, then I invite you to consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the show notes of this episode. There are many running costs associated with running a podcast and I rely 100% on the generosity of patrons. Thank you so much to those who already support the podcast. And most importantly, please continue to pray for me and for all of those who are listening.